Hello everyone, I am Shadi Reyes and this is Heart Trending. In these videos, I would like to highlight recently published article in cardiology and interventional cardiology journals. I hope you find it useful for your practice and for taking better care of your patients. Thanks for watching. In this video, we're going to go over a couple of articles that are very practical for the interventional cardiologist. The article number one is going to cover uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy interruption in patients who are high bleeding risk population. This is a very important topic and keep comes again and again for patients who receive PCI and who are high risk bleeding uh, population, meaning they are older, they have history of cabbage before, they have history of uh, uh, multiple comorbidity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, it's very interesting and also uh, has a lot of take home messages that are going to help you with your practice. Article titled Bleeding Risk Dual Antiplatelet Therapy Cessation and Adverse event after percutaneous coronary intervention, the Paris Registry. The article published at the Circulation Cardiovascular Intervention. The first author is Sabato Sorrentino, MD. Last author is Roxana Moran, MD. Whether the underlying risk of bleeding influences the association between pattern of dual antiplatelet therapy cessation and adverse event after percutaneous interve intervention is unknown. This is a very important topic because really we don't know how the high bleeding or non-high bleeding risk population stop their dual antiplatelet therapy and whether this interruption of therapy have a major impact on ischemic and bleeding event. In this study, patients enrolled in the prospective International Multicenter Paris Registry and were categorized according to the risk of bleeding using the Paris Bleeding Risk Score. The Paris Bleeding Risk Score has been published and validated before evaluating the ischemic and bleeding risk for patients who underwent percutaneous coronary intervention. In this study, the authors evaluated the incidence, pattern, and association between mode of DAPT cessation and outcome across bleeding risk group. Modes of DAPT cessation were identified as physician-guided DAPT cessation or what's called discontinuation, Temporary less than 14 days cessation of DAPT due to need for invasive procedure or what's called interruption. And finally, cessation of DAPT due to lack of adherence or bleeding or what's called disruption. A total of 5,018 patients were include, included in the analysis. 48.8% were low breathing risk. 41.0% were classified as intermediate risk. And 10.2% were classified as high bleeding risk population. Baseline characteristics showed that patients who are high bleeding risk are older and have more comorbidities compared to non-high bleeding risk population due to increased diabetes, anemia, chronic kidney disease, smoking, and previous PCI and cabbage. In terms of incidence, pattern, and association between DAP cessation and adverse event, physician-guided DAP discontinuation was noted to be 20.1% for high bleeding risk at one year, 14.1% for intermediate risk and 9.6% for uh, low bleeding risk group. At two year follow up, physician guided DAP discontinuation was 41.0% for high bleeding risk group, 43.1% for intermediate, and 37.9% for low bleeding risk group, p value of 0.004. DAP disruption, on the other hand, was 17.7% for high bleeding risk group at one year. 10.4% for intermediate risk and 7.8% for low bleeding risk group at one year. At two year follow up, 22% of high bleeding risk population had DAP disruption compared to 15.1% for intermediate bleeding risk and 12.0% for low bleeding risk with a p value of less than 0.0001. Physician-guided DAP discontinuation was not associated with increased risk of major adverse cardiac event in both high bleeding and non-high bleeding patients, while DAP disruption was associated with an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events across all bleeding risk groups. There was no interaction between the bleeding risk status and clinical outcome for any cessation mode. Um, the findings are very practical and highlighting that patients at high bleeding risk remain at increased risk of both ischemic and bleeding events after PCI. The rates of physician-guided DAP discontinuation and DAP disruption are higher among patients with high bleeding risk. Interestingly, physician-guided cessation of DAP appear to be safe irrespective of underlying bleeding risk status. However, cessation of DAP due to bleeding 
or non-compliance is associated with significantly higher risk of adverse event in both high bleeding and non high bleeding risk patients. The second article is from Jack Intervention, also it's related to the uh, Vavim valve management. As you know, there's a lot of patients going, refer to the TAV currently for Vavim valve or failed uh, surgical valve. In this cohort of patients, they compared patients who underwent valve and valve through the TAVR technology versus uh, redo SAVR. Um, very interesting findings. Hope you find it useful for you and your practice. And I am very sure you're going to encounter this patient uh, down the line. Uh, thank the title of the article is Transcatheter Valve and Valve versus Redo Surgical AVR for the Management of Failed Biological Processes. The main author is Derek Tam, and the study was done at the University of Toronto. The main objective of the study was to compare early and late outcomes between redo surgical aortic valve replacement and valve and valve transcatheter AVR. A very important topic and uh, we are more now see Mayo patients refer to the cath lab uh, as well as to the heart team for evaluation for valve and valve. So in this study I think it's very important and highlight a few things uh, that help you for patient selection and also to discuss the outcome in these patients when you sit with them to discuss options surgery versus TAVR. The data for this study is a clinical and administrative database from Ontario, Canada. Propensity score matching was performed to account for differences in baseline characteristics. The study included 558 patients undergoing intervention for failed biological processes between the year of March uh, 2008 and September 2017. The Vavin valve cohort was 214 and redo surgery was 344. Patients who underwent Vavin valve were older and had more comorbidities. The 30 days mortality was significantly lower with Vavin valve compared with redo surgery with absolute risk reduction of minus 7.5%. The rates of permanent pacemaker was also lower in the valve and valve cohort as was length of stay. Survival at 5 years was higher with valve and valve 76.8% versus 66.8% in the surgical group. The conclusion of this article was valve and valve TAVR was associated with lower early mortality, morbidity and length of hospital stay and with increased survival compared with redo surgery and may be the preferred approach for the treatment of failed biological processes. Called title Incidence and Outcome of Acute Coronary Syndrome After a Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement, the article published at the Jack Cardiovascular Intervention. This is a very important topic, and um, uh, since now the rate and utilization of TAVR is increasing with the younger population undergoing TAVR. Therefore, the incidence of acute coronary syndrome or unstable angina post-TAVR and how we manage it is very important to know. The author identified Medicare patients who underwent TAVR from 2012 to 2017 and were admitted with acute coronary syndrome during follow-up. They compared the outcome based on the type of acute coronary syndrome, whether it's ST elevation myocardial infarction, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, and unstable angina. 142,845 patients with TAVR out of which 4.7% were admitted with acute coronary syndrome after a medium time follow-up of 9 plus months. 48% of the admission occurred within the 6 months. The most common presentation was NSTEMI. Predictor of acute coronary syndromes were history of coronary artery disease, prior vascularization, diabetes, and valve and valve TAVR. A state elevation myocardial infarction was associated with higher 30 days and 1 year mortality compared with NSTEMI at a rate of 31.4% compared to 15.5% and 51.2% compared to 41.3% with a p-value of less than 0 0.01. It was surprising to see that only 30.3% of the NSTEMI cohort were treated with invasive approach. Invasive approach was associated obviously with lower adjusted long-term mortality, however it was associated with higher risk of repeat vascularization. This is an administrative database as we know and that it has its own limitation, however it still delivers a very important message that we should implement clinically. The major highlight of this study is the predictors of occurrence of acute coronary syndrome within 6 months after TAVR that include admission with ACS within 1 year before the TAVR and VAV and valve TAVR and history of CAD before the TAVR and PCI within 6 months before TAVR. 
Oftentimes, these patients have a uh, coronary artery disease as well as aortic valve disease and there is a conflicting literature about which one we should fix first is it the coronary artery disease then the TAVR or the TAVR followed by the coronary intervention however based on these findings it seems like PCI within six months before TAVR is associated with higher degree of ACS after TAVR therefore if it is not necessary or high grade of obstruction uh, prior to the TAVR it's probably is important to defer this intervention after the TAVR intervention especially in patients who are VAV and valve. The author concluded that ACS is infrequent with less than 5% happening post aver but the majority of the acute coronary syndrome is due to end STEMI. Optimization of care is needed for post aver ACS patients and if feasible, invasive approach is favorable in these high-risk patients. Thank you for watching. This is Shad Reyes from Heart Trending.